Sister Annette. I think that's the first time there's been singing in this sanctuary in about almost two months now. Other than me and Pastor just singing to ourselves in here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Solo and having karaoke battles. Did you record it? No. <laughs> Do appreciate y'all making the effort to come out and uh, taking the social distancing seriously and sanitizing and everything and we do continue to pray for everyone that we'd all stay healthy and even in this time of upheaval and uncertainty the lord's been good to us he continues to bless and uh it's been a real uh, blessing to not get any like real terrible devastating news from any of our church family while this whole thing's been going on uh, I did mention Wednesday night, if you were here, my cousin Kelly, who's living out in California right now, that she had been showing most of the symptoms and a few of her coworkers had come down with the virus and they had tested her before she started showing symptoms and it was negative, but now that she's been showing symptoms, they tested her again and she did come out positive, so she does have it. Uh, she's had it, been showing symptoms for about two weeks now though and is feeling a lot better. Still has a sore throat, she said, and coughing a little bit, but. Other than that, seems to be on the mend. So I'd appreciate you continue to pray for her. That's the only personal one to me that I've heard that's had it. Uh, any ones that I know, actually, anyways. But do pray for her, Kelly. She's out in California, away from all the family. So my Aunt Diane and Uncle Scott are still in Georgia. And her brother and sister are in Georgia also. And, of course, we're all down here. So she's by herself out there. She went out there for a job, maybe six months ago or so, and that's what you get for going out to California. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, pray for her. I, she's on my heart here. So, uh, We're going to be in James 4 tonight, if you got your Bible with you, James chapter 4. I've been doing a series through James, sort of off and on, and about every time I hit the end of a chapter, I, I go bounce around a little bit more, and then we come back to James, but we have been doing... Uh, chapter 4 here pretty consistently. We're going verse by verse through the book of James, and it's been a real blessing to me to really dig in and uh, study. You know, I've preached out of James before, but just sort of sporadically, but to actually go every single verse and not skip anything and really dig everything we can out of every little word in it uh, has been a beneficial to, to my own study and devotional time, but hopefully you've been enjoying it too. We're about halfway through with chapter 4 here. We're going to start at verse 11 tonight and uh, just give you a little bit of context. Um, James as a whole, he's been sort of giving us throughout the previous three chapters and here in the chapter 4, he gives us a lot of ways that we can sort of test our own faith and see if our own faith is real faith. Is it saving faith? You know, is it that faith that... Um, actually works and you know, lets us get born again. We know by grace we're saved through faith. Faith is very important to, to the believer. And um, the writer of Hebrews tells us it's the um, substance of, of things unknown or unseen. So faith is, uh, is real, but it's, it's a topic that atheists or non-believers often you know, mock us for, is our faith, right? We hear, well, oh, there's no evidence, you know, they're not scientifically minded, they just, they just have faith in that, you know, they don't have to prove anything because they just take it by faith, and, and they laugh at us, they mock and scorn us for our faith, but to us, uh, faith is one of the most important things we have, Amen. and it's, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's really everything to us in a lot of ways, you know, nobody has seen God, personally, uh, if you have, you might need to see a doctor. If you have visions of them, no, we don't see them. Uh, we can't feel the spirit when it comes and lives inside of us. We don't, you know, we weren't there when Jesus was walking the earth. These are all things we believe by faith. Uh, but once you do start to believe, once you exercise that faith, it's amazing how it becomes real and how it comes alive to us. And um, that's one of the things I, I tell the early believers or, or recent converts. I always say, start reading the Bible and believing it as you read it and that, that's made a huge difference to me when i first got serious about god and my own relationship with him is 
And I talk about this all the time, you know, if you read a lot, the Bible can, you might think, oh, it's just another book, it's just another story, it's just another, you know, fiction thing that I'm reading. But no, we read the Bible differently. And that's why, I, one of the reasons why I love uh, the King James still is because it sounds different than anything else that I read. <laughs> you know, I don't read really anything else in King James English, so it, there's a, a majesty to it, a, a weight that it gives it. Uh, with the these and nows and the, you know, rejoice if the ETH ending, it reminds me that I'm reading something that's different than just a story, that, that's different than something that a person wrote. Uh, yeah, this yeah, is man. God's word. Uh, and so, you know, uh, anyway, James is telling us, here's some ways you can test your faith and make sure it's real. You know, we want, that's something that's, <laughs> it's important to be sure about. <clears throat> you know, we understand that at the time of our death or when Jesus comes back, there's one or two, uh, one of two destinations we can go to, you know, to put it, you know, sort of flippantly, it's, it's up or down, you know, we go to heaven or we go to hell and we spend an eternity in one of those two ultimate destinations. So I'd like to know for sure that I'm going to heaven. Amen. I mean, we have everything to lose if we miss out on heaven uh, an eternity of, of bliss in God's presence um, with our fellow believers, you know, for all eternity up there where, where there's no pain, no sorrow, no suffering, no sin, no more temptation. That sounds incredible, incredible. Not to mention just the, the decor, you know, the streets of gold would be pretty impressive to see. Uh, and hell is an eternity of torment and suffering. Jesus said there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I do not want to spend five minutes there, let alone hundreds of thousands, millions of years. That's a terrible fate. Uh, but hell is just as real as heaven. And uh, if our Bible is true, and it is, uh, we have faith that both of those places are real. We want to know for sure we have that saving faith. That I've had that, Jesus said, just as small as a mustard seed will do. I want to make sure I have at least that much. And then I can get to heaven. You know. And also, uh, once we start walking in faith, uh, many more blessings just while we're still on this earth can come. But that's another sermon for another time. So that's sort of been James's motif here, moving through these chapters. He covers a whole lot of topics, a lot of practical stuff for just daily Christian living. But really, he's showing us uh, these different ways we can test our faith. And getting into, um, into chapter 4, the last time I was in here, he really started drawing our attention to the idea of humility, Right? Verse 6 of chapter 4 here, he says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. So humility is one of those markers, those keystones of, you know, if you really do have faith, if you really are saved, you're going to be a humble person. You're going to show humility. There's no way around it. You know, part of being saved is understanding that uh, you were unworthy, and that you were a sinner deserving of hell. And that you couldn't earn your way to heaven. And no matter how hard you try, you couldn't uh, be pure and perfect and righteous in God's eyes. Even if you had three really good days in a row, that fourth day you're going to slip up. You know? that, that makes you humble when you realize, I, I'm not you know, the center of the world. I'm not the bee's knees. You know? I'm not all that in a bag of chips. I have problems. I have flaws. Uh, I struggle with sin. You know, being saved is... Part of that is admitting those things. So that, that causes you to humble yourself. Even believing there's a God forces you to humble yourself. Amen. You know, to the, the naturalist or the atheist, uh, mankind is essentially the greatest thing in the universe. You know, we've never found aliens. You know, we struggle to even find bacteria and stuff on the moon or other planets. Uh, the, all the animals, there's some really cool ones, but none of them are as smart as we are. You know, none of them are as self-aware as we are. None of, you know, you don't go down the ocean and the dolphins have built skyscrapers and have a subway system down there. And those are pretty basic technology-wise. I mean, we have the internet now, smartphones. We're beaming signals around. Nothing else compares to us on this earth. So if you don't believe there's a God, you feel pretty proud of yourself. You know, I'm awesome. You know, we look out at the whole universe... And there's very few things that are even alive. And of all the things that are alive, none of them are as grand as we are. None of them are as smart as we are, again, as technologically uh, sound as we are. No one's creating things like we are. Um, 
humanity is pretty cool, you know, compared to the, the rest of the universe. Until a God comes into the picture, Amen. who's even greater than we are. He's so awesome, so powerful, so great, that what we thought was the coolest thing in the universe, he actually made us. You know, he created us. Yeah. You know, we look at great pieces of artwork, and you know, I'm looking at the painting right back here. And, and Sister Margie's done tons of great paintings that you all know. It looks really cool, and great artwork is grand to look at, and it's really great, but what about the person who made that or who painted that? You know, how special must they be if that, that's just something they did in their free time and that they created from their own imagination and with their own hands? Uh, it's impressive. God molded us you know, from the dust of the earth. He created us. He's, he's lived longer than any of us ever will. Uh, he's, he existed in eternity past and he exists in eternity future. He's outside of time. You know, the sun is huge. And I forget the number, but you know, they always say like 18 billion Earths could fit into the sun. You know, <laughs> the galaxies are massive and impressive. And if I love these, you know, nature shows and planet Earth and stuff like that. And the cool, you know, the Carl Sagan stuff from years ago. And they, you know, the little blue dot he called Earth and it, they show these computer-generated pictures of zooming out from space and how Earth must look from so many light years away, et cetera, et cetera. It's huge. All of it's vast, you know, essentially infinite. And God made all that stuff. He created it. He's inconceivably powerful uh, and mighty and glorious. I mean, it, it's words. Words don't do him justice. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you know. Uh, 66 books written about him and all the great things he's done and people are still writing books about him and still writing praise and worship songs still writing hymns about him there's just you know what the i could sing of your love forever this is the refrain of a popular modern worship song words don't do him justice so that causes you to humble yourself just admitting there's a god you, admitting you're a sinner is an act of humility admitting there is a god who's greater and over you and has authority and sovereignty over you causing you to humble yourself. Um, he, James continues here in verse 10 of chapter 4. He says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. So he spent the last few verses here leading into our text tonight talking about the, the virtues or the benefits of humility and humbling yourselves and how that is a great marker or indicator of true faith. If you're a humble person and not proud, um, you know, Tons of, of writers of the Bible have talked about, if you're going to boast in anything, boast about God. <laughs> you know, that's really the only thing worth bragging about. Nothing you accomplish, nothing you achieve, nothing, no amount of fortune that you can amass while you're on this earth is worth bragging about. What's worth bragging about is how awesome God is and what he's done for you and what he continues to do for others. So James says a great indicator if you're wanting to test your own faith is are you humble or not? Leading in again to verse 11, our, our text tonight, is, he gives an example of someone not being humble. So here's an example of a way that you can be proud as opposed to exercising humility. Let's read verse 11. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth, judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Verse 12, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Okay, so some rhetorical questions in here. And James uh, really driving the point home that as opposed to being a humble person, there, there's a way that is the other side of the coin. And that's what he says, speaking evil one of another. What he's talking about here essentially is slander, okay? Trash talking your fellow believers. And it could be, you know, trash talking about something that's true, or it could be, you know, spreading lies about someone or gossiping. Uh, but basically, it, it's slandering um, your fellow believers. So, why shouldn't you do this? Or why is this the bad thing? James gives us three reasons. The first is because. Uh, the people that he's saying not to do this to are our brothers and sisters. Amen. You shouldn't slander a fellow Christian because they're your brethren. James loves that word. He, he addresses his whole letter 
uh, to the, you know, back in chapter 1, he says, James, the servant of God, to my brethren, verse 2. That's who he's writing to, who he's talking to. And we talk all the time about how, or what a blessing it is that we're not just friends who come to the same church. We're not just neighbors who, who come to the same building to worship God. But no, at the point of salvation, we become spiritual brothers and sisters. It's a tighter bond than family. And I talked about this uh, this past Wednesday, actually. Uh, so he says here in verse 11, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law. So he reminds them off the bat, you shouldn't be doing this because these are your brothers and sisters. Amen. There's some, you know, something about family that we treat them different than just a, a stranger on the street. Right? You know, and that's the old movie trope or just little kids growing up, uh, you know, hey, you can't talk about my brother that way. And then they get in a fist fight, you know, <laughs> or the older sister defending her younger sister from the bullies, that kind of situation. It's, if it was just a, one of her classmates getting picked on, maybe she would stand up for him, maybe not. But no, that's my blood. That's my family. Now I have to, you know, stand up for it. We understand that there's something different about family members than just a, a normal acquaintance. Or a normal friend, right? We feel um, more loving towards our family, perhaps. We feel more protective of our brothers and sisters. We feel that that kinship and that bond, and it's because we we share a history. You know, if you have, you know if you have actual siblings, actual biological brothers and sisters, you know we we came from the same place. We grew up in the same house. Uh, we got whooped with the same belt. You know, I, I have a bond now with my brothers and sisters because we, we came through the same struggles and we're, we're living in the same family, going in the, the same direction. As spiritual brothers and sisters, again, we have that bond and even more so. We understand that we have been redeemed uh, from the same terrible sins. We have been saved by the same wonderful, glorious Savior. We are struggling in the same fallen, sinful world. And we're on the same path with one another. You know, the Christian life is tough. And it's a, in many ways, it's tougher than the, well, while you're alive, it's tougher. At, at the end of it all, it's going to be tougher for the non-believer. But uh, an a atheist or a, a non-believer or someone who follows a, a false religion or another cult, they don't have to deal with wondering, you know, ha am I pleasing the Lord? You know, have I, do I have this saving faith, you know? Um, is my relationship with God where it should be? You know, am I living up to all that God wants me to be and, and accomplishing all that he has for my life? No, the non-believer just kind of goes their own way, does their own thing. They are their own master. They're not trying to please anyone else. For us, we understand there is a God who's watching. He does see everything I do. He does hear everything I think. You know, he does have expectations for me. He does want me to do these things and not want me to do these things. Um, you know, our relationship with God is not burdensome, but it certainly is. Uh, it can be, I guess, maybe stressful. You know, I, I want to please him because I know he's a fearsome and terrible God. I know he loves me unconditionally. I know he's patient with me and long-suffering. I know he's shown me great grace and mercy, but he's still God, and I'm just the, the follower. He's the king, and I'm just one of his subjects. And then we, you know, we, we think about that, and we have that conscience, that Holy Spirit now that convicts us when we mess up. The non-believer doesn't have that. You know, as you hear about a cold-blooded murder, and it's like they had no guilt about it. I don't think a Christian could murder someone and not feel guilty. You know, God will let you know right off the bat, hey, you messed up. That was a serious thing that you did, you know. And we're kind of being a little facetious here, but any little sin now, especially the closer you are with God, the more in tune you are with his spirit working in your life, you even just tell a little white lie and you feel bad about it. Oh, gosh, why did I do that? Oh, the Lord, he knows that wasn't true and I said it anyway. You know, whatever, any little thing like that. Uh, we have that conscience now working on us and reminding us, hey, you're supposed to be perfect, you know. You're supposed to be loving in every situation and preferring others to yourself and giving uh, as much as you can and, and living for others and using all your time to glorify me in everything that you do. The non-believer doesn't have to worry about that. They're not thinking about that. So 
Speaking evil one of another is a sin now, right? It's a terrible thing. And it's bad, he says, first of all, because these are our brothers and sisters. Right? It's a bad thing to do. What's the uh, second reason he gives? We'll read verse 11 again. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. So the second reason, one, we shouldn't speak evil of one another because these are our brothers and sisters. This is family that you're trash-talking and slandering. The second reason is when you talk bad about a fellow believer, you're not necessarily just talking evil about them or slandering them and judging them. You're slandering God's word, the law. Well, how is that so, Brandon? Well, because he has said not to speak evil one of another. So when you do it, you're... <laughs> You're breaking one of his rules. You're, you're breaking the law that he's given in his word. And he's, he's talked about this all throughout scripture. Uh, God has, I mean, and I've jotted down a few, uh, few examples. This is from Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 through 19. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Solomon gives us a list here. Here's a couple things that God really doesn't like. <laughs> and he says, uh, here's seven of them. A lying tongue, that's speaking evil of one another, is a lying tongue, right? If you're lying about someone, you're doing wrong by them. A lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Three of those seven by my count count as speaking evil of one of another. Right? Lying, uh, sowing discord among the brethren, being a false witness, and speaking lies. These are all things, of, of seven things that God hates, three of them are about, you know, slandering other people, or telling lies, or using your tongue for wicked things. God's serious about this kind of sin. Amen. So when we do that kind of stuff, again, it's not just uh, against the person you're slandering, but it it's against God himself. Here's Exodus 23, verse 1. Thou shalt not raise a false report. Put not thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Raising a false report. Again, lying. You know, giving a false testimony. Paul talks about it, Ephesians 4, 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Evil speaking makes his list of, if I'm going to tell you, just give you a short list of things not to do, evil speaking makes the list. Psalm 50 pretty much says that wicked people or sinners are, they're almost like addicted to this kind of behavior. This is verses 19 and 20 of Psalm 50. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother, thou slanderest thine own mother's son. Here's a couple more Proverbs, 16, 28. A froward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends. That's how bad evil speaking can, can get. It can ruin the relationship between besties, between best friends. A, a whisperer separateth chief friends. Proverbs 17, 9. He that covereth the transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth the matter separateth very friends. Kind of the same idea there. Repeating a matter is, you know, what we call, we'll look at this word here in a second, but being a talebearer, as the Bible says, or a gossip. So we're not just speaking evil of our brother, we're, we're speaking evil of the law, judging the law. Here's what the Moses' law says about this. Leviticus 19, 16. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. Jesus says in the New Testament, Matthew 7, 1, judge not that ye be not judged. Right. And again, this is, you know, 1 Corinthians tells us we will be the judges of the world, <laughs> you know, eventually. We are meant to, you know, point out sin when it occurs. And the Bible within the church gives clear, you know, if your brother has sinned against you or you notice him in a fault, go to him one-on-one -on -one first. You know, there's steps to church discipline like that. 
We're not saying that we just totally ignore sin. And you see someone messing up, just keep your mouth shut. It's none of your business. Thing. Don't get the wrong idea about that. We are meant to you know, hold each other accountable and encourage one another to stay on the right path. So first, if someone sins, you go to them personally. If they ignore you and keep on at it, then the Bible says bring two or three witnesses and confront them again. At that point, if they still won't listen and still mess up, then you bring it up to the whole church. Right? There's, there's an increasing uh, level of severity when you see someone uh, stumbling or, or backsliding. But that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is actually just lying about somebody or spreading a story about them when it, it's not serving a purpose. Say they messed up, you went to them, they said, you're right, I was messing up there, I've, I've uh, prayed about it, asked God to forgive me, I'm, I'm not going to do that anymore, I'm back on the right path. And then like a week or two later, you say, man, did you hear what so-and-so did? And start telling them how they messed up. That serves no constructive purpose at that point. You did the biblical thing and went to them, confronted them with their sin, they admitted it, confessed the sin, and got back up and moved forward, that should be the end of the matter. Amen. But the temptation is, you know, I, there's, I got some juicy gossip I got to spread. You know. And really the heart of the matter is whenever we do something like that, it's, it's, a, it's a, like James was saying, it's the opposite of humility. Uh, it's a pride issue. This person messed up, so that makes me better. Right? When you tell a story about someone slipping up, the implication is, even if you didn't say it, is, well, I would never do something like that, obviously. <laughs> you know, I, I would never s struggle with that sin or stumble in that way. Um, even when we don't say that out loud, that's where our heart is at when we're speaking evil, tail-bearing, gossiping. That's what we're doing. It's the opposite of humility. Humility recognizes there but for the grace of God go I. Amen? You've heard that phrase. We understand any time someone's struggling or sinning or has fallen that only by God's grace that wasn't me that day doing that sin. Uh, the, the, the humble believer always recognizes and understands any day could be the day that I fall if I'm not walking wisely and circumspectly and looking out for the traps of the enemy so that I avoid them. Any day could be the day I mess up and get caught slipping and let Satan claim the victory that day. Any day could be that, you know. If you're the believer who thinks, well, I've been saved for 38 years and I'm sin-free for the last 10 and, uh, you know, I've pretty much got this whole thing figured out now. I got it beat. Uh, no, no one is, is finished yet. No one's done. No one's totally complete and holy and righteous until we get our new glorified bodies and are in heaven with God where there is no sin anymore. And it's not that, like, we get there and now, wow, the lights have finally come on. Now I'm so mature now. I will never sin again. No. If God hadn't just said there's no sin up there, we'd probably still be messing up even in heaven. <laughs> He'd still be forgiving us and showing us grace and mercy. No, luckily for our sakes, he gives us a whole new body that's not this uh, fleshly body anymore. It's not struggling with sins anymore. We're not even feeling the temptation anymore. If we were, it, uh, then we would, again, still be slipping up. So... A humble person recognizes that, and that's what keeps them from being a gossip, being a tail bearer, spreading uh, lies about one another. Again, if, even if it's a lie and not the truth that you're talking about someone, the reason that you're lying about them is to make yourself look better, to put someone else down in order to lift yourself up. Uh, it's a pride issue at, at the root of it all, and that's why he follows it, uh, this passage on humility with immediately this example of, well, here's someone not being humble. So two reasons that we're not speaking evil one another is because we are brothers and sisters. We are family. Second of all is because it's not just talking bad about them. You're talking bad about the law. Here's the third reason. Verse 12. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? The third and final reason why we don't speak evil one of another is because only one person actually can create the laws and has the power to enforce them, and that's God. Right? There's one lawgiver. Moses didn't write the Ten Commandments. God carved them with his finger on the tablets, and Moses just said, Thus saith the Lord. You know, here's the rules. Right? God is the only one who has the power, as the Bible says, to both save and destroy a human soul. 
Right? When we're gossiping or tailbearing about another, when we're judging another, speaking evil of another, we're saying, I have the authority to set some rules and regulations. And this is another thing that plenty of Bible writers talk about or plenty of churches have struggled with throughout history is adding on to this. You know, and Paul, I think it's in Colossians, um, talks about, you know, these people who make rules and saying you can't eat this or eat that or you can't get married. And, and different religions have struggled with adding rules to the gospel and saying, yeah, sure, God came up with some good ones, but if we really want to be great, here's a few extra rules. And that always causes trouble. <laughs> Anytime you try to add or subtract from God's word, it causes issues. And that should be obvious, but we still think, well, God gave us a good baseline. You know, it's a good way to start, but I think I can help him out here with enforcing some of his rules. I think I can help him out with clarifying some of these things and maybe adding where he, uh, you know, again, that's, that's speaking evil of the law. Because my Bible says uh, in the Psalms, the law of the Lord is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. It can, it can change our lives, just the, the law, the rules can. Uh, when we say there needs to be some more laws, that means this Bible is lacking in some area. That God just, uh, it slipped his mind, or he wasn't, he couldn't have foreseen, you know. We're calling God's omniscience, his all-knowingness, into, into question when we think, well, when God wrote this, that was a couple thousand years ago, he would have never thought that we would be here, you know. He couldn't have actually foreseen these struggles that we would have gone through. No, God, God is all-knowing. He's infinite. He, even back then, he already knew who I was going to be and what I was going to do. Before my granddaddy's granddaddy's granddaddy was even born, God already knew me personally and, and knew I was going to get saved one day. Praise the Lord. He knows everything and can see into the future. When we try to add to this or put ourselves in, in God's position, again, that, you know, it's a form of blasphemy. It's saying God is not the ultimate authority. He, he did a good job, but I've got a few places I can help him out. You know, and again, we might not say it that way, but think about it. When you're telling someone, uh, you broke this law that I made up, and that's a big deal, and now you can't come to this church anymore. You know, this is just a random example. But when you're saying that, uh, what you really mean is, I have God's authority to, to give law. And James reminds us, no, there is one lawgiver. Only one. Not God plus anybody. Not God uh, and then this other committee or these other um, authors. No, there's one lawgiver. He's the only one who can enforce, right? Who else can reward righteousness and punish wickedness like God can? Nobody. Nobody can. No one else can promise you heaven for following their rules. Uh, he, he made it, and he alone has the ability to let people in. You know, there is no other heaven other than the ones God has created. Uh, you know, and who else can punish like God can? Yeah, jail is pretty terrible, I've heard, um, but hell is a nightmare, an absolute nightmare. Uh, he alone has the power to kill you and then punish you for eternity. <laughs> you know, he's the only one who can. Uh, he, he's the one lawgiver. And James ends it again with this rhetorical question. Who art thou that judgest another? In other words, who do you think you are to, to act like you're God? So I love how James, you know, it starts out, he's saying, you know, speak not evil one of another. It's almost like you're reading that, okay, well, sure, I shouldn't talk trash about people. And then it, he ends this little section here, and these two verses are kind of, you know, self-contained. Uh, but it... What starts as just a, you know, don't talk bad about people, ends with, there's a person who can destroy, and who are you to think uh, otherwise? <laughs> you know? he, he, he makes it serious. He makes it deadly serious. You know? Lying about fellow believers, talking trash about your brothers and sisters, speaking evil, uh, judging them, imposing your own morality and your own laws on them, is as bad as putting yourself in God's position or trying to think that you get, uh, are as powerful as him. Who was the first person that struggled with that? It was Satan. Right? Remember in the Old Testament? I will, I will, I will ascend to the throne of the Almighty. 
Satan was jealous of God and thought he could do a better job than him. You know, tried to overthrow uh, the Lord. Now, I know we wouldn't think of me talking trash about somebody is as bad as Satan, you know, leading a rebellion against God in heaven. But James is making that comparison here. You know, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He does slander us to God on the daily. You know, we see it firsthand in Job. He goes right up there, you know, just personally talking trash about Job to God, slandering his character, saying the only reason he's righteous and good and follows you is because he's got all this stuff. He's so rich, powerful, and has all these belongings. That was a lie, right? Job was a good and perfect man, the Bible says. He was always praying for his family, always doing good. Satan was lying about Job to God, you know, or trying to, as if he could just, you know, convince God of something that he doesn't know already. Uh, when we act that way, we're, we're acting satanic. You know, Jesus said that uh, he accused the, the non-believers or some of the Jewish folks of being uh, like their father, the devil. He was the father of, of lies and a murderer from the beginning, he said. Lying is, is satanic. You know, the, the enemy, Satan, is the father of all lies. The Bible calls him that. He is the accuser of the brethren. So when we're acting that way, we're acting like him. And that's not what we want to do. You know? So think about these things. You know, we all, I know we like to classify sin in order of severity. Well, at least I'm not a murderer. At least I'm not a rapist or a thief. Uh, you know, and you think, well, okay, you know, yeah, I've, I've lied about somebody before. I've spread gossip and rumors before. Uh, James was reminding us, no... All sin is deadly serious. God takes it all very serious. And speaking evil one of another is, is more deceptive. You know, this is something we, we can do and we kind of convince ourselves. I know it's bad, but I, just, I, I, have, I like doing it. You know, I like spreading the gossip. I like, you know, chewing the fat with my friends and t talking like that. We, we take the severity away from it and sort of try to justify it in our own minds. Let James' verses here... Uh, be our reminder tonight that no, it, that's a, a deadly serious sin. It's satanic in nature. And God takes it very serious, and you're not just talking trash about other people. You're, again, speaking evil of the law, judging the law when you do something like that. So uh, I don't want to make you feel too bad. <laughs> we'll end on a light note. God still loves us. Amen? Amen. He's not just able to destroy. James throws in there, he's able to save. And he will. You know, that, that's why that James is telling us, test your faith, make sure it's real, because God can save. He's willing, he's not willing that any should perish. Amen. He wants to save us all. Uh, and we know that we can receive that salvation by faith. And that's why the faith is such a great thing. That's why James uh, harps on it so much. So we'll finish out chapter 4 the next time I speak to you. Uh, but for now, uh, we'll pray and we'll be dismissed, okay? Father, we do thank you so much for your word. We're thankful for the great men of God from ages past, like James, who were moved by your spirit to, to write these things and, and give us these lessons that, that we can still study, even these thousands of years later. God, uh, give us the grace and the wisdom to understand that you do take sin very seriously and that there really is no uh, little such thing as a, a white little sin or a white sin or something that's not that serious in your eyes any one single sin is enough to send us to hell but lord we're thankful that you're a gracious and merciful and, and long-suffering patient god who puts up with your disobedient children lord and we're thankful that you're willing to forgive us again just give us the wisdom to to see and have our consciences pricked when we do mess up like this and to um to love one another like we're meant to love Lord, we talked to this past Wednesday night about the unity within the church and how a, such a blessing it is and uh, the benefits that we get as a church body when we're all unified. Lord, continue to give us that spirit that, that we would love one another and uh, treat others like we would want to be treated, Lord. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.